Hello there, and welcome to a Q&A that, uh, between Tony Higginson and my good self, decided to put together for the purposes of entertaining and educating. I suspect it will be <laughs> more entertaining than educating. But welcome, and thank you so much for all of the questions that you have asked on Landscape Locations UK, Landscape Locations Worldwide, and Tony's group, Landscape Photography UK on Facebook. So Tony and I will spend about an hour talking uh, about some of the questions that you've asked. I hope you find them fairly informative. Uh, and we do appreciate you taking the time as well. Now I will be seeing sipping from a cup because I do have a particularly sore throat today. Don't worry, I am self-isolating. Right, so we'll start with questions in Tony's Landscape Photography UK group. So uh, let's welcome Tony. Hello. Hi, Tony. <laughs> <laughs> plenty, of chance for, plenty of chance for us to do plenty of talking in this next hour. There will be. It's quite, uh, it's quite unusual. And we, we must say, obviously, um, for the purposes of the current situation, I am in my home. Tony is in his. Uh, we're using Zoom to do a split screen uh, live uh, video conferencing, which we will obviously upload to the relevant groups on Facebook. So we're going to start with Tony's group. Um, we're going to start with a question from Justin Laidlaw, and I've got him to my right-hand side, which is why my eyes are flicking. So, Tony, which of Melvin's photographs is your favourite? And Melvin, which is your favourite of Tony's? Uh, I'll let Tony start with that one then. <laughs> uh, let's have a think about this. You've taken a few nice shots over the years, Melvin, and uh, but there's definitely one that stands out for me, and it's your photograph that was in Landscape Photography of the Year a couple of years ago. It's the shot you took at um, Buttermere in the floods. It's yeah. just, it's just, it's such, um, it's such a sort of uh, moody image, and it's unusual. So many people photograph that tree, but you captured it in very unusual uh, conditions with yeah. the very high waters. And it's just got that moodiness. It's got the colour. It's just a cracking shot, you know. And mm. when I think of your images, for me, that's the one of all of them that I think that's the one I would like to have taken. And so it's that Interesting. image. Interesting. Funnily enough, in the April's edition of Digital Camera, I think it is, the magazine, uh, page 39 from memory, uh, Landscape Photography of the Year <laughs> competition. <laughs> That's well scripted. <laughs> Landscape Photography of the Year competition as a one page full advert for the competition. Uh, and just incidentally, uh, the closing date has been pushed back from the 5th of April to the 10th of May. So if anybody wants to enter any uh, images, you've got another month or so in which to do it. And good luck because we'll be entering as well. Um, but they've actually gone with the advert uh, uh, of that same uh, image of the tree. So obviously it's the famous Buttermere tree, shot five days uh, after the huge flood about four years ago, five years ago. Um, very unusual conditions, uh, quite difficult to get to, uh, to be honest, because of the amount of water that was around in the Lake District. But what I'll do is I'll do a little blog uh, and I'll discuss the image in a little bit more detail. Um, now your image, you know, I mean, a lot of these have been taken while we've been out together, to be honest with you. Um, but having looked through, I would say the one that, uh, the one that I would have printed on my wall. I always use this as a good indicator. When people ask me about images and, 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 and which ones happen to be my favorite, I always visualize which one would I want sitting on my wall? So I'm going to go with a shot taken in Harris. I think I was with you on that day. And I think we were down at Bove Beach and you were taking some rolling waves coming in and you got a lovely shot of a lovely green aqua shot of the wave as it was about to roll over some lovely white um, uh, sort of uh, spin riff coming off the top. Beautiful, beautiful shot. So much detail and texture and color. Um, and that sums up sort of Harris for me, absolutely. And it's a, it's a shot that's so difficult to get as well, so difficult to take. Uh, and you've been trying for a couple of years to get that particular shot, I think. And that would oh, be the one that I would put on it on my Five wall. years. Five years it took me to start 
really capturing the the movement of waves. Is that a panning shot? Yeah. That one. You know what I'm about? Yeah. Is it one that I'm panning? Not particularly. I mean, there's loads of detail in it. Oh, I'll, right. I'll, I'll put the image in the comment box below the video so people can see. I, I, can't, say, I, don't, I don't know which image you're on about. Did, was it me? <laughs> Did I take it? Or is you're, it taking so many, you're taking so many good shots, Tony. They're all blended <laughs> into one. Yeah, they must have. They must have. I'll, I'll put my button here image and you'll win. I'm going to look forward to seeing what it looks like. <laughs> Well, it must be a good one if I've picked it. Um, yeah. So anyway, good question, Justin. Good one to start with. Um, Kitty Juggins. I'd love to know what your basic setup is for a sunset photo, um, such as what your starting point for settings would be, long exposure or short exposure, and at what point of the sunset would you aim to capture it, i.e., before the sun drops down or after? Very good question. Tony, over to you. <laughs> it is a good question. Um, I got a lot of hate on my YouTube video where I talked about not shooting into the sun. And uh, mm. I do think there is a case for shooting sunrises and sunsets looking directly into the colour. You know, and I do do that occasionally myself. But more often than not, I, I like to use the light of the setting sun or the rising sun to illuminate mm. the landscape. So do you remember when we were up in Sky last time and I got that picture of the Kerrang? Kerrang, yeah, yeah. Still and I, I, I went round to the side. So I got yeah. some, I got the pink and the colour in the sky from the side. But yeah. I also, I got the light shining right across all of the, Trottenish Ridge, Trottenish Ridge and all the features. Yeah. That's how I like to shoot sunset and sunrise, really. That's my kind of go-to method of shooting. I like to use the light. If I do have, yeah. if I do, if I, if I am shooting directly into the sunrise or the sunset, the key is making sure that you've got usually some kind of reflective surface or something it's going to stop all that foreground being blocked out in black. Mm. Now, it's possible to pull a lot of the detail out of that you, because of modern cameras, you know, and pulling the shadows and pulling all that detail out. Yeah. But it never really looks right to me. It never really looks right. I'd rather get a shot where the light is there. Yeah. And, you know, and then you get the drama. So that's my approach to it, you know. I know you have a different approach to this, so... No, nah, well... I, 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 I'm lucky. I'm well versed in, in both, uh, in both, um, uh, in sort of the variety of, of ways that, that you can shoot sunrise or sunset. So I'll give you an example. The Callanish Stones on the Isle of Lewis is a very, very popular shot to suit, uh, shoot at sunrise. Um, now we get there about an hour before. You know, whatever the time the sun rises, we get there about an hour before. Me and my clients. I'm after the colour in the sky you know, pre-sunrise, ideally. Get that in the bag, get that in the can, that's great. Get some lovely colour, get some lovely detail in the sky. The, you know, the rocks themselves, the, the stones can be either, you know, silhouetted or if your camera is, uh, you know, has enough dynamic range or you bracket your images, then, then you can pull detail out the stones. However, as soon as the sun rises, um, I do tend to move into position quite quickly to have the sunburst effect. So you get half the sun is blocked out by the stones and the other half then sort of splinters, which works very well at say an F16 when you've got a very, uh, you know, a very small aperture and, uh, and the sun tends to, uh, tends to sparkle then, if you will, tends to sunburst. So, uh, but shooting directly into the sun is something I used to do an awful lot when I first started, sort of 12, 13 or 13 years ago. I don't tend to do it too much these days. I mean, ironically, better cameras with better sensors, better dynamic range, tend to allow you to get away with it a little bit more. But for me, it's more now about the colour post and post uh, pre sunrise and post sunset. Uh, but again, it depends on the scene. What you're shooting? Are you shooting, you know, across water? Are you shooting across land? Uh, you know, what time of the year is the sun particularly harsh? Do you have cloud? You know, masking some of that sun some of the colours kicking back up to illuminate the cloud. There's, 
you know, the, the, it's very, very difficult to ultimately define what you would do. You've got to get there and be there and see what sort of uh, transpires when you're on location. But for me, a bit like you, it's the colour that I'm after rather than the sun itself. So, yes, it's a means to an end. Um, long or short exposure. If you're shooting the sun itself, I think Tony will agree, the sun, like the moon, moves. And if you're doing a 30-second shot, quite often the sun will have shifted quite a, a considerable amount within that 30 seconds. So it's, long exposure is quite tricky when you're shooting directly into the sun. If you're shooting water, of course, if you're doing, say, Mary's Shell down on the Fowl Coast near Blackpool, uh, you know, a nice sunset, you might opt to do a, a two-second exposure to keep texture in the water. You might then decide to do a long exposure to uh, have the water completely milky, if you will, uh, and almost, uh, almost misty in its appearance. Um, but so long as you're capturing the light and the colour off it, you know, again, that does depend, doesn't it? It's, I mean, Tony, do you, you don't tend to do a lot of long exposure post-sunset, I don't think, do you? I, I, don't, I like using the light of the sun. Once, yeah. the sun's gone, once the sun has gone, I'm not generally that interested in just shooting the colour. The only exception is if I'm going to create a silhouette. So if I'm going to shoot mm. the sunset, reflected in wet sand, maybe a bit of a, a figure silhouetted yeah. or something delicate within the scene. But beyond that, I'm not really that interested in post, you know, um, the post pre-sunrise or yeah. post-sunset images. It's, it's just not really my thing, you know. Yeah. Well, we're all different. and Every, Everyone's but, different, you know. Um, yeah. And people do love, love to get that colour. But... I'm more interested in creating um, in having the light. A, bit, a bit more to them. Mm. It's ultimately, it's about light, and I want light on my subject, not just yeah. in the sky. So, you know, it's each to their own, but that's just how I approach photography. You know? It is, it is. And again, it all depends on the, uh, on the uh, subject that you're shooting as well. But excellent questions there. Thank you, Kitty. Yep. Um, she also compliments you on your choice of photo that, you, uh, that accompanied your post. She hasn't seen mine. Uh, <laughs> okay, Terry Delbridge. Uh, where do you focus in landscapes to get the sharp pictures back to front? Do you focus stack? If so, how? I'll throw that one over to you because you use a particular lens that helps. Yeah, I mean, I, I still do occasionally focus stack if, if, if it's necessary. But I often shoot on uh, a 24 mil tilt shift. So that gives me the ability to tilt the plane of focus forwards. So I can have the foreground, the midground, and the and the, the distant uh, mountains or trees, whatever they are, all in yeah. focus because I can tilt that plane. So, you know, I often shoot at f8, f9 using my tilt shift lens. And even though the subject is quite near to me, say three, the first thing in the photo might only be three or four feet from my lens, I can still have everything sharp. Yeah, uh, and that's how I sort of choose to do it. In terms of focusing, I just use the basic kind of. Um, it's like I don't use an exact method of of working out hyperfocal distance. I just kind of use experience to say what's the nearest thing, what's the furthest thing that I want in focus, and then mm. I kind of based on that. I select the aperture and I focus a bit past the nearest thing in focus, you know, and that's just kind of experience. And with time, you get to understand where yeah. you need to be. Um, but in the meantime, while you're learning, that you there's you you show people an app sometimes, don't you? Yeah. So when I'm when I'm on location, um, you know, teaching uh, on workshops and one to ones, it's quite useful to use a hyperfocal distance app. Um, they're often free, either Apple or, or, or an Android. Um, and that basically allows you to type in the camera that you're using so that it can uh, establish what size sensor uh, you're using, you're shooting on, what focal length you're currently shooting at, your aperture, f8, f11, f16, and the distance at which the subject that you wish to fo focus on, uh, you know, how far away is that? So if you're shooting, I don't know, uh, a wooden jetty at Derwent Water, you're going to want, say, the, the entry point to the bottom of your image is eight foot from you. That's the lowest 
part of your frame, if you will, right to the mountains in the background or the fells in the background, then you're probably going to want to focus maybe a third of the way or even halfway down the pier to ensure that you've got enough in front of the pier that's in focus. It doesn't have to be in focus a couple of feet from you or even three foot from you. It's got to be in focus at the point at which it then creeps into the image from the bottom of the frame. Your background generally is always taken care of. Uh, if, you're, you know, if you look at, say, F8 and you're focusing 20 foot down the jetty, your background will be in focus more often than not from F6.3 all the way to F, F22. Uh, when you go beyond F16, F14, F16, the quality of the outside edge of your image tends to start to suffer. It goes a little bit soft, um, but you have to decide uh, at that point uh, what takes precedence really. Is it going to be depth of field? Or is it going to be, uh, you know, your aperture in which you're shooting at? Now, I do shoot the focus stack because whilst I have a tilt shift lens, um, I don't tend to use it very often. So if I'm shooting, uh, I was in Iceland recently shooting a, a little ice section in a river and I wanted the river behind and the, and the waterfall um, sharp. So I used three shots uh, focus stacked at F8, F8, F11. Absolutely fine. Use Photoshop. It's very, very simple to stitch them together. No problem at all. However, and this is quite important. Tony, you still shoot on a Canon 5D Mark IV, and I shoot on a yeah. Canon EOS R mirrorless. Now, technology will change the way in which you shoot. So on the Canon 5D Mark IV, you have no tools to help you determine really where you should be focusing. Unlike on the mirrorless camera that I have, and most mirrorless is, I've got manual focus peaking. So in manual zoom, manual focus mode on the lens, the screen will shimmy red on the areas that are actually in focus, which is fantastic. So you don't even have to then select a certain point in which to focus. You can just turn your manual zoom on your lens until your screen goes red back to front. And there's also another feature on the EOS R I think it's called a focus guide where there are three little points and when you have selected your focus point say on say on the fourth post on your pier and when you turn your manual zoom these three points come in together and when they hit that particular post they'll all go green to say that that post is now absolutely pin sharp so no longer do you have to use auto zoom no longer do you have to zoom in manually on your LCD to be able to see precisely where you are focusing. So modern technology makes things a little easier, speeds things up and makes you a little bit lazy, to be honest with you. But in terms of teaching, the hyperfocal principle, uh, I think, works quite well. It's not infallible, but it does work very, very well. Uh, but yeah, great question there. Great question, Terry. Uh, or two of them, in fact. I hope that's answered it. So Josie Waters. Oh, yes. She would like to do a painting of one of your photos, Tony. <laughs> uh, Martin. Uh, here we go. Martin Stokes. Uh, you must both have visited many, many locations in the UK during your time uh, in photography. What would be your top five? Your top five UK locations. No, I have written mine down. Have you had prepared? <laughs> Yes, absolutely. Do you want to go then? Well, I think. <laughs> yeah, I'll go first then. Okay. So these are places that I have repeatedly gone back to in the hope of nailing that perfect shot or just a place that I love to go back to um, and spend time there. So here are my top five. Number one, Derwent Water, Lake, Lake District. Very briefly, the reasons are there are lots and lots of different things you can photograph. Uh, you can shoot from either side of the shore, east or west, depending on the light, the sun direction. There are wooden jetties, boats, islands, uh, you know, fences in the water. It's just a fantastic place. It's also where I first started learning about landscape photography, where I would spend many a day. So do it water in the Lake District. Second one, Holy Island, Northumberland. Now, Tony and I have been to this place. And we used to go when the tide was out, like everybody else. And we had a brainwave, didn't we, one day? We said, why don't we go on? Because you have to drive across a causeway, which then gets flooded. 
and then you're on the island for several hours and you can't get off that island. And we decided one day while we were up there wrecking and, and just having a jolly for a week that we'd actually go on while the tide was coming in and we'd be forced to stay on that island then for several hours. And that transformed the island, didn't it? Oh, yeah, much, much better. For photography especially. Yeah. yeah. And people don't tend to think about that. All the cars are coming off to get back onto the mainland. So A, you end up with a place that's incredibly quiet. I mean, really quiet. And B, you've got a lot of water coming in around old jetty posts, uh, you know, the harbour slipways and various things. It's, it's, you know, and you hardly see anybody shooting it at high tide. Go at high tide. Number three, the small beach on Harris. Now, there is, <laughs> there is a Scottish name for it. I'm not going to try and pronounce it. Um, but it's, uh, it's just a little further down from Borv Beach. And it is a small beach, isn't it, Tony? It's just... It is. It is. But it, it's perfect. It's a, beautiful, it's a beautiful place. I took a picture there that was in last year's Landscape Photography of the Year. Yeah. Uh, at the small beach, where I waited for the wave to come in, go out, and I got that really nice leading of, like, the uh, a fan shape. Uh, just gorgeous. It's just a great place. Yeah. It's the best place on Lewis and Harris for me, that beach. I love uh, it. Yeah, and, and I, I think I'd uh, concur. The, the, I took an image there that made the front cover of the Scots magazine for the 280th anniversary last year. Um, great orange sky, beautiful clouds. But it's, it, the, the thing with that beach, it's called the small beach, um, but it really is. <laughs> it's the smallest one. But it, see, the, the, the beach seems to be angled at a point where you get the lovely rollers in the background whilst the tide is actually going out around the rocks that are there on the beach. And it's just, I mean, you get the odd surge, of course. You've got to be careful of the odd wave that comes in quite high. Um, but there's so many, so many different compositions and different options there. It's just a fantastic little beach. And a couple of our friends, John and Phil, had been up there recently, and I think they said that that was their favourite place. Oh, they, yeah. They, they were up there last week, 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 week before. It's just brilliant. The small beach. I think it's called Treg Bierg. That's it. <laughs> it's as That's good it. as you're going to get from me. Um, Elgol Sky. That's a yeah. place, of all the places I've ever shot in this country, I would say that's probably the most mysterious. If you, and Tony and I have been there in all sorts of different conditions. Um, you know, when it's heavy laden, the black coolings, which act as a backdrop, uh, with the Joe Cornish boulder on the, uh, on the sort of beach, if you will. Um, but the whole place, you know, a lot of the bad weather, a lot of the d sort of challenging weather tends to revolve around the Black Coolings, which provides a fantastic backdrop. But you've got so much going on in the foreground as well. You can also shoot right next to the car from the car park if the weather is that bad. So it, you've got a lot of different options there, but it's such a mysterious evocative place, I think, Elgol, uh, that when you get the right weather, it's just fantastic. It really is. El Elgol is, 100% uh, Elgol is on, on my top five list as well. There's no yeah. doubt about that. It's, uh, mm. I went up recently during Storm Kira, 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 whatever, it, however you pronounce <laughs> right. it, Storm, Storm Kira. Yeah. And I went up with a couple of friends, Chris and Danny, we went up for two days and we pretty much spent two full days during yeah. the main windy um, sort yeah. of uh, period of the storm. And we, we just went to Elgo. Yeah. And it was fantastic. I got those, I got a lot, lot of time to spend really getting to know it. And I've mm. been lots of times before, as you said. Yeah. But we got some images there that I'm really, really happy with. And there's some yeah. absolute. Some absolute, so probably uh, as things stand at the moment, my favorite ever favorite. images. Yeah, um, probably about three or four images I took that one, one particular day there. I mean, if you get the right conditions at El Gol, there's just oh. nowhere better. That's yeah. in yeah. my opinion. Yeah, I agree yeah. with that one. Yeah, I think, it, and, and the fact that you've got to drive 14 miles to get there down a, a quite a tight, narrow road, then you've got to drop down into it as well, and there's nothing there. Even the toilets aren't open anymore. I mean, it really is pretty damn remote, but it, it's, it's just superbly uh, atmospheric. Um, and the fifth one is the Fylde Coast here uh, in Lancashire. I mean, I was born in Blackpool, only 15 minutes down the road. Um, the Fylde Coast can uh, encapsulate uh, Lytham, St. Anne's, Blackpool, Fleetwood, Cleveland. Um, you know, Lancashire doesn't have a great coastline in terms of photography. It's no Northumberland. It's no Jurassic Coast. It's no, say, the West Coast of Scotland. 
but for what we have here, um, you know, things like piers, got four big piers, wooden jetties, uh, public art sculptures on the beach, you've got the fishing wrecks at Fleetwood. You know, there's more to shoot than you realise, uh, I would say. And we've all gone down on many a sunset and shot straight out, haven't we, uh, over the ocean with, with, a, with a North Pier in the background and the starlings drifting in and out. Uh, I think the Fylde Coast has a lot going for it, and it's not overly shot either, which is fine for me. <laughs> I'm happy about that. So I'd say the Fylde Coast, partly because I, you know, I know it very well. I run workshops here, um, but I just think it's got a lot to offer. Uh, people, if you can avoid, you know, shoot, shooting it in the summer when you've got twenty thousand hen and stag parties, then <laughs> at Blackpool you'll be fine. You'll be fine. So that's my top five. Yeah. Well, I've got Elgol, obviously, same as you. Um, Clack Toll Beach in Ascent. Yeah. Love Clack. Love Clack Toll Beach. Yeah. It's got for people who don't know, it's got a huge rock slide. So there's a big triangular wedge of rock that's yeah. slipped down into the sea. Um, it just makes a great feature on the horizon. Mm. Just a great place to shoot. There's lots of different ways of using leading lines and I've shot waves there. It's just a great place. Love Clactol Beach. So that's definitely yeah. there. Another place in Ascent, because Ascent is probably my favourite place in the UK. Mm. Uh, maybe the Lake District, I don't know. But there's a little spot off the wee mad road where you can you can walk across it's a pretty tricky boggy walk uphill takes about half an hour and you get to a place with lots of erratic boulders oh, yeah, yeah. and you get views of stack poly yeah uh, culmore Sylvan, mm. uh, and i've spent so many days you know n never spent full day but i've spent chunks of threes and four hours just up there just yeah. waiting for the weather to come in, waiting for storms to roll past. You yeah. know, you've got to go prepared in waterproofs, but up there, when you get the right light, it's magic. And yeah. I've got a picture from up there that I took at the workshop work, uh, The workshop that I ran. Um, when was it? Was it what year? Last year. L late last year in Assen, I ran a workshop. Yeah. And I took this picture up there, and it's been featured in this year's Landscape Photographer of the Year uh, in Scotland, Scottish Landscape Oh, yeah, the Scottish one. Yeah, yeah, with a rainbow and a bit of light. It's very nice. Yeah. So definitely, there's two from Assin, Elgol. It's got to be the Lake District. And for yeah. me, a place that's, a place that's very uh, special to me is a place called Todd Crag up Luffrig Fell. Yeah. And it was the first ever landscape trip I went. A friend of mine called Tony, I was at college doing photography. He said, we're going to go landscaping. And he took a few of us up to Todd Crag. And I saw, I was, I was it, it was a bit of a treat really, because it was a cold day and we had a full inversion. We had a sunrise, every, everything you want. And it was the first in. ever trip. Well, in a way I looked in, but then in a way I didn't, because all my pictures were rubbish. Because <laughs> it was my first ever landscape trip, so I didn't really know what I was doing. And I got home yeah. and I looked at all my pictures and I remember thinking, it looks so amazing. <laughs> Look at these. Mm. <laughs> and that's the process everybody goes through. Yeah. There's a lot of people who are very hard on themselves. Yeah. But when you're learning, everybody you look at who's a good photographer, they've started out taking rubbish shots, missing oh, opportunities. Yes. <laughs> yes. We, we all do it. And, and that was a classic mm. example. But because I live fairly close to there, about an hour's drive, I've been fortunate and I've been going there at least once a year, every year for the past eight to nine years. And I've seen probably around 10 inversions up there with sunrises. And it wow. is just a gorgeous place. I absolutely love it. Um, yeah. and well, I, I, I think the Lake District, pound per square inch, I think it offers an unrivaled amount of photography. So many different things to photograph. Uh, you know, regardless of the weather as well, there are a lot of places you go in bad weather, you can't really shoot, you don't get a great deal, but the lakes, regardless of the weather, the time of the year, there's always something to get. And it's so compact as well. I mean, we are blessed to live near the Lake District. I, I wholly agree, wholly agree. Yeah, I'll, I'll just be quick on my last one. My last one, I'm just gonna say, just the South Lakes in general, just mm. around, you know, you've got places like Kelly Hall Tarn and Tarn House and 
Homefell, Elter Water, all these different places. They're just great little spots. And I spend most of my time there. So that's yeah. definitely got to make the list. So that would be my five. Yeah. Good question. Yeah. yeah, no, it is. Very, very, very good question. So, uh, yeah, thanks, Martin. Um, now, Rich Noons. This will be a quick one, I'm afraid. <laughs> uh, do you have any advice on colour space? SRGB versus Adobe GB uh, or RGB. And do you or can you print in house or externally? And if externally, could you recommend anyone? It's a very simple one for me. I shoot in sRGB uh, because the images are, most of my images are shared online. The odd one or two do get printed, obviously for clients and, and for myself. Um, but sRGB will allow you to print pretty damn accurately. Obviously, you know, using the. Uh, you know, uh, an Epson uh, A2 printer, it's all been, uh, you know, color proofed and, and various other things. But uh, certainly for images online, sRGB, I would say, is the preferred. So in camera, sRGB, most of the stuff goes online anyway. Uh, and I have a friend print out my images. I don't sell that many because I don't advertise myself as a printer. I'm hardly in the country as it is most of the time. But if you're looking externally, I would probably recommend places like uh, Loxley seems to be, uh, in this country anyway, seem to be the, the premier printing process. I think if you're looking externally, uh, outside of this country, probably Whitewall, Johnson's of Nantwich. Uh, but really, for everyday printing, Loxley, or even uh, DSCL, but I think I prefer Loxley. Tony? Oh, don't even ask me that. I'm, I'm falling asleep listening to your answer. <laughs> All right. No offence, Rich. It doesn't, it doesn't get our juices flowing, that one, I'm afraid. But it's a fair, a fair question. Um, but printing, yeah. I don't print that much, to be fair. Uh, Dave Brown. When it comes to editing your shots, do you go for a more natural look or slightly oversaturated whilst on the subject of editing? Do you use presets? or prefer to do everything from start to finish? Well, that one I'll leave for you to answer first, I think, Tony. I edit all my landscape work in Photoshop. I don't use any uh, presets. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't use any other editing packages, silver effects or anything like that. I do everything myself. And I do most of it in using layers and camera raw. So I use a lot of curves. I do a bit of split toning from time to time. Um, I do color adjustments. I do sometimes, in fact, I almost always push the vibrancy up, mm. but then I'm doing other things which reduces contrast and pulls the color down. So if I didn't add vibrance, my pictures would look too undersaturated. Yeah. So just experience, but I do everything in Photoshop and I do my black and white conversions and because I've got, I've been doing, I've done a lot of it for a lot of years. Mm. I'm quite good at editing, I think, and I can get every effect that I need in Photoshop. So I'm a control freak, as people sometimes say on my group, <laughs> but <laughs> when, uh, with yeah. my photography, I like to be in control of what's happening. Um, yeah. And so it, it's all, it's all Photoshop for me. Yeah, no, that's a fair point. Um, I would probably say, uh, yeah, I mean, I don't use Lightroom. Um, I use Adobe Raw, uh, Photoshop, uh, in which I will use layers, which actually Tony taught me on, uh, on, on, the, on the basic principles of layers. And, and it is, uh, it's a revelation. Once you get your head around layers and the ability to be able to adjust certain parts of your image rather than globally, uh, you'll never look back. Um, the next stage may be luminosity mass that I haven't gone into. That seems to be the next stage on. Uh, and I also use Nick software. Uh, not so much silver effects because I don't really do much black and white, but I will tend to use probably six or seven particular presets within uh, Nick software. Things like uh, auto white balance, which is called white neutralizer. Seems a little better than the uh, Adobe one. Uh, things like polarizer. There's an excellent polarizer filter in there. Sunlight filter, darken center, darken the outside uh, and, and lighten the center. There's a few things that I use. Um, but I would say I probably, I probably saturate my images more than Tony. I think we've got very different styles in editing. 
Uh, Tony seems to get away with producing high quality work with more muted tones, whereas I tend to be a little bit more saturated. Uh, not overly, I would hasten to add. Uh, you know, I've not gone down the American fine art market yet. <laughs> um, the, the, but the issue really is that, in essence, every image you see is not an accurate representation as to what you shot. Because there could be 10 of us, shoulder to shoulder, same camera, same lens, same setup, shoot the same thing, all 10 will go home, and all 10 will edit them slightly differently, or very differently in some cases. So, you know, uh, there's nothing out there that's 100% accurate. It's all... It's all either a recreation from your memory as to what you think you saw, and as that gets older, <laughs> it becomes more and more unreliable, I would say, um, or you're trying to go for a, a you know, deliberate effect, uh, you know, high key, uh, various other things, uh, you know, to deliberately uh, enhance the image, uh, perhaps a little bit too much. So, uh, excellent question. Um, Malcolm Harris asks, best use for wide angle lenses? And in the landscape. <laughs> well, I'll start this off. I generally don't shoot wide angle lenses. Um, I'm using one at the moment because my 2470 is broke and I can't get it fixed because we're, we're in lockdown. Um, mm. So I don't have that range. So, but I've got my 1635. So I have been shooting um, with it a bit more. Um, and I'm still not a massive fan of wide angle, although I've entered an image into this year's Landscape Photographer of the Year competition, which I took in Glencoe. And it's it's a really nice shot. It's got a beautiful lead-in line through to the mountain. And the, and I wouldn't have shot that if I wasn't limited to using a wide angle lens. So it did yeah. actually give me a bit of a, a reminder of what can be produced with a wide yeah. angle if it's used in the right way. One yeah. of the... One of the drawbacks to wide angle photography is, is, is I see it as this. We spend a lot of money going to these amazing places, often for what's in the background. So we'll go to Elgol and yeah. I see people at Elgol and the first thing they reach for, I want to shoot it at 15 mil. I want to shoot it at 14 mil and get all this foreground and everything in. And what yeah. happens is the coolings shrink. They're just tiny little dots yeah. on the horizon. And yeah. that's why I'm there. I'm there to include the coolings in my photographs. So mm. for me, it's not a really about shooting wide angle. And mm. one of the disciplines that I found by moving to a 24 mil tilt shift is it, it kind of limits me to 24 millimeters. And yeah. I find that sort of being restricted in some ways has really improved my work because I'm no longer relying on the wide angle, and I'm going to say this, but people will hate mm. me for saying it, the wide angle gimmick, you know, and <laughs> it's kind of easy to shoot yeah. a wide angle shot. It is easier to shoot wide angle. You don't need to bother as much with depth of field because almost everything's in it at 15 mil. Mm. Um, and it's like, pick something, put it in your foreground, and yeah, it's great. And I'm not saying you can't get great wide angle shots. There's some fantastic wide angle work about, but there's a lot of it that's not that good and yeah. people would be far better trying to shoot at 50 mil or 24 mil, 35 mil and yeah. their work would improve. So there's a little tip for you there. Just instead of going straight for that wide angle, try mm. something a bit longer and you'll become a better landscape photographer. Yeah. I remember going out years ago with a 50 mil with a nifty 50, um, going to Yorkshire to shoot waterfalls. And, uh, and the last thing you want to be shooting waterfalls with is a 50 mil because you generally want the rock in the foreground, you want wide angle. But uh, I tell you, if you use it often enough and you limit yourself to a set zoom, a set focal length, uh, even on a zoom lens, leave it at a certain, say, 35 mil on a 1635 or a 2470, and you will find that your compositional skills will, in, will improve. There's no doubt about it at all. Um, you know, if you, if you only had primes in your bag, you would have to shoot according to those primes. You know, uh, assuming of course you can move in and out of the shot using your legs rather than using the, uh, the zoom lens. But it's good compositionally, but you're right. I think people do tend to use wide angle lenses to get everything in the shot. Whereas I tend to like using them to get up close to things, to knock things out of perspective. You know, uh, it might be 
I was shooting the uh, the fishing wrecks at um, the old boat wrecks at Fleetwood last uh, ten days ago, two weeks ago, and uh, you know a wide angle allows you to get close to it, and it distorts its shape as well, and it makes it more dramatic. Um, so you know there are different ways of using a wide angle lens, definitely. But for me, I think it's more about getting in there than getting out. You know, which I think is quite interesting. Incidentally, what I tend to find certainly on workshops is the newbies to photography, the people coming into it, they'll always buy a wide angle lens, but they'll always shoot wide. And then you've then got to try and teach them how to get into your subject. And it's about more about what you leave out of the, the, the scene rather than what you can get in it. And, you know, instead of getting a very wide scene, you know, get closer to your subject and really hone in on that one particular subject matter, which you really want, you know, to dominate the image. There are different ways of using different... Uh, uh, different lenses for sure, uh, but yeah, very good, uh, good question that Malcolm. Thank you very much, uh, Joseph Limbo. He says and zoom lenses. So it's the same question, but with zoom lenses. Um, now uh, I'm sure Tony will back, back me up on this. I love okay. shooting with a seventy to two hundred. <laughs> uh, maybe <laughs> a Canon <laughs> yeah. seventy to two hundred. I have an f four. I love shooting landscapes with a 70 to 200. Ah, and it's so underused. People don't tend to think about shooting landscapes with long lenses. Um, it tends to be the last lens they'll ever go for, but you know, I, I love to reach it, you know, chuck it on the camera and start to really get in on the, uh, on the landscape and just pick out uh, you know, various things. And, um, and also we talk about compression between back and front, don't we? We talk about you know, trying to bring whatever's in the background a little bit closer to you so that the perspective is a little bit shorter. Uh, and you can only really get that on long lenses. That's a very uh, highly debatable argument, but it, it does seem to work. So, but I love a long lens. I'm sure Tony does too. <laughs> I, do, I do. I mean, I shoot a lot at the 200 mil end. I love, um, yeah. I love, like you say, compressing images. Using a long lens does test your technique mm. a bit more things like camera shake come into play a lot more you've got yeah. to have your technique right mm. um, you've got to be you've got to be sharper when it comes to composition your composition has to be right but yeah, yeah love it um in terms of zooms uh, th there are some people and, and primes some people who are like oh i love me primes i'm a wedding photographer um, yeah. not, not this year <laughs> I'm normally a wedding photographer in the summer months mm -hmm. and I shoot almost all my weddings with an 85 mil prime and a, and a 35 millimeter prime about 85 percent of my shots are on the 35 mil prime yeah since I've switched to primes my work has improved I'm photographing people I'm having to use my legs I'm working in and out you know yeah. it just makes me a better photographer for landscape not so much. I, I like zooms. I mm. like the flexibility. It doesn't mean that I just stand in one spot and zoom. Mm. I decide where I want to be. Yeah. And then I choose the appropriate focal length so I don't have to crop. Yeah. So I get the best image quality. So for landscapes, I love my zooms. Mm. For shooting people, primes. That's just my, my take on it. Because I also think in, in the landscape, you've got many other uh, factors that limit uh, where you can stand and where you can shoot. You know, I, when, when <laughs> we used to be a member of a camera club, we used to enter the competitions and a judge would stand there and say, oh, it's a lovely shot of, uh, you know, you're at the edge of a cliff face and you're shooting out at the islands and in, in, in the ocean. Oh, it would have been lovely if you'd have just stepped two foot to your right. You think, well, if that had been the case, I'd have been, <laughs> I'd have been in a six foot wooden box. I wouldn't, be, uh, I wouldn't be sat here listening to you because I'd have fallen off the cliff. So there are times when, you know, you need to rely on, on a zoom lens in order to get the shot because you're limited in other areas. So excellent question, Joseph. Uh, Hugh says, interesting question. He said, are there any financial lessons that this current lockdown has taught us both? I.e., with both of your businesses, uh, are there any behaviors that you will change and why and what will you think about them differently in the future when planning purchases or making financial decisions so obviously Hugh's referring at the moment and if you're watching this video back in six months time I hope even in three months time you know this won't be applicable but at the moment we're in 
the country's in pretty much lockdown mode because of the coronavirus and you know we can't get out with the camera that's 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 the reality um and and how that's going to impact on, uh, on our businesses so tony's a wedding photographer primarily does the odd, uh, landscape workshop and all of my business is primarily landscape workshops um do you want to start the ball the ball rolling on this tony well, for me i had uh i don't normally plan my workshops massively in advance maybe six to nine months yeah so it's affecting the decisions i make in terms of running workshops so at the moment it's probably looking like i won't be planning any workshops in this year mm -hmm. but I probably will be running a sky workshop, I think, maybe an async mm -hmm. workshop in spring 2021. So I'm able to just sort of roll with the punches. Um, yeah. Financially, this isn't yeah. going to really make too much difference to me. Uh, yeah. I'm just going to crack on, keep doing what I do. Uh, and Most of your weddings have been put forward to next year now, so yeah, you've not lost the trade. They're all being postponed to 2021. So I'm going to have a busy uh, spring, mm. actually. Uh, yeah. And sort of February, March, a lot of them are changing to those dates. So that's fine. Yeah. I just really go with the punches. And it, it, at the end of the day, it kind of comes down to good financial management. You know, when yes. you're self-employed, like me, mm. I have to think that there's always possibilities that things, yeah. can, things can happen out, out of my control. And obviously, as a self-employed person, I've been self-employed now for to over 20 yeah, years because when I was a plasterer, I was self-employed. Yeah. And again, I had to account for injury. I can easily get injured, you know, and yeah. unable to, I was unable to work or nowadays I would be unable to shoot a wedding or do a workshop, whatever. So I've got to build that kind of flexibility yeah. into my business, which I do, you know, and that's yeah. just common sense so it's not really changed much in that uh, in that respect really no no it's interesting um and i've actually had quite a few people sort of uh, email me and message me privately uh, asking uh, you know asking how this is going to impact on my business because uh, this is my sixth year as a full-time professional landscape photographer uh, and in the last three years in particular certainly the last two years i'm running a lot more international workshops and there's the crux there's there's the issue if you're running them in this country, it's much, much easier, much easier. When you're running them abroad and you've got flights involved, you've got uh, car hire, or minibus hire, you've got hotels in particular, you know, it, it adds a certain level of complexity anyway. Um, and obviously now we're looking at, say, the autumn, I'm just looking at my wall planner, uh, looking at the autumn workshops that we've got lined up, you know, are they going to take place? Uh, ironically, my first one is in Tuscany in September. <laughs> Probably not the place that most people want to be going to. Saying that, all this could be um, done and dusted by June, July, August. Uh, fingers crossed. And touch wood that it is. But um, yeah, it, it's uh, you know, it's not going to affect the way in which I move forward because you can't plan. Uh, I mean, uh, Tony obviously plans uh, a certain amount of uh, sort of c contingency plans in the event of something going wrong. Uh, yes, I mean, I, I you know, we could all injure ourselves uh, on location and rule ourselves out for several weeks uh, which is a bit of an issue when you're running workshops um, but again it's having a certain amount of you know perhaps financial backup uh, you know having a great client base that will you know be flexible with you and, and change dates rather than cancel there's lots of things that you know if you build up a, a very loyal following of, of clients they will tend to look after you uh, as well as you hope that you look after them so I think that's a big part of it uh, you know, try and treat people as you expect to be treated yourself. And generally, that, that, that seems to be uh, certainly helping my situation. But the reality is, we'll get to August, we don't know what's going to happen. We don't know what's going to run, what isn't going to run. You know, um, yeah, uh, it, it's an unknown quantity. And I think that's, that's the stressful bit for a lot of people. They don't know how long this lockdown is going to go on for and, and how much it's going to disrupt, you know, uh, finances, the business. You know, and I do feel for those that will go out of business. Um, you know, I mean, I quite, quite happily go back to nursing, which is what I did before. Uh, you know, there's always a career there. Uh, I'm sure Tony doesn't want to go back to plastering. <laughs> I'm sure of it. Um, but, you know, I, I, I have skills uh, elsewhere which I could rely on, uh, you know, to, to, to bide my time. So, um, you know, and I'm lucky I'm single with no children. 
there's only me to worry about. So, uh, but no, it wouldn't change my behavior uh, because you just can't plan for something quite like this, uh, to be fair, but good questions. Uh, and purchases, well, the things that you purchase, you can sell. That's one of the good things. You, you buy lenses, you buy cameras, you buy filters, you buy uh, excess equipment, certainly in, in wedding photography, you've often got two camera bodies. You know, if things get so tight, you do have equipment in which you can sell. So uh, it's not all doom and gloom. Um, uh, let's have a quick look. Oh, Kitty Juggins back again. Uh, another question. What are your top tips for finding good shots? Uh, well, just look at where Tony's been and then I go in the complete opposite direction. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, do you, do you pre-plan shots or do you just go out and see what you find? That's a good question. Good couple of questions. It's a, very, it's a very good question. And it's at the core of my approach to photography is I don't want to recreate other people's images. I absolutely do not want to do that. I've no interest. I have mm. no interest. You know, Melvin mentioned the Callanish Stones before, and they're a great place to visit. Mm. I, I've been a couple of times and visited them. I barely took a photograph because mm. I was just, I'm not really interested in capturing another image of the Callanish Stones. I didn't feel that I could bring anything to that place. Yes. Um, Unique. And it was, and it was freezing. Freezing. <laughs> freezing. I was like, I can't be bothered. Um, mm. So when I go somewhere, I will deliberately not research it. You know, yeah. and, and that's a lot of the fun for me is exploring a new place and finding it for myself, yeah. you know, and turning up and going, wow, look at this, look at this place, you know, and, and then that kind of pleasure you get from discovery. Mm -hmm. And then as a photo landscape photographer, my job, well, it's not so much my job or what I enjoy is then translating what I can see into a, a great, hopefully a great mm -hmm. landscape photograph. And that's the real pleasure. So the yeah, idea that I would yeah. go and copy someone else's image, and even if it was only subconsciously, if I was looking on things and saying, oh, that's nice, I'd like to, I don't want to do that. I want yeah. to take my own shot. And above anything, I'm interested in creating completely original pieces, in, ideally in places where nobody else photographs. Yeah. You know, so yeah. if I can, if I can uh, find a new little bit of woodland, search it, find a nice little composition within it, Yeah. then that's an original piece. Someone might have been there with a camera, but quite a lot of these places, they're quite unexplored because everyone's busy going to Bambra Beach, mm, yeah. going to Penmon, Penmon Lighthouse, going yeah. to, you know, all these hotspots. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with going to these places mm -hmm. and taking the shots. But, just but, 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 I think I think a lot of it is try to be creative. Yeah, try to be I think a lot. I mean, Melvin's a good example. I'll just cut you off there, Mel. I love cutting you off because you uh, you do go on. But Melvin took a great shot from uh, of Saint of Mary Shell about two mm. weeks ago. Mary Shell is shot to death. I've shot it long exposure, short exposure. It, it's a cracking place to shoot. Mm. But Melvin went and photographed it at night with a fast shutter speed by using high, IS, high ISO. I've never seen another image like that. Mm. And that's just thinking outside the box. And I love to see yeah. images that are completely fresh from somewhere that's well photographed. So yeah, that's embrace that. Mm. That's, I mean, it, it, it is difficult. I think, I mean, uh, to try and come up with something unique uh, is, is, is probably much more satisfying to be able to come up with a shot that either nobody else has seen before of a place that is not familiar. And you can say, yeah, I've grafted, you know, I've gone out there, I've, I've done the legwork, uh, I've invested time and effort and energy and money getting, get, get, getting out there. And this shot is all me, you know, and you've got to get, and, 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 it, and it's interesting when you do it for yourself or you do it for the business. And when you're doing it for the business, when you're running workshops, as, 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 as Tony will allude, but certainly when, when I'm running them abroad, I do a lot of research, partly because when I get there, I don't want to be wasting time. I want to maximize the time on the ground. 
Um, I like to know where I'm going to park and where I'm going to walk. What I what I get when I'm there is, is is entirely up to me. But I like a you know I like to be fairly well drilled. I must admit. Now, obviously, uh, if you go in for business, you've got to get the bankers. You've got to get the hot shots that everybody gets because the, those are the shots that people are going to pay you to help them uh, sort of capture for themselves. Um, so, you know, you go to Lofoten, you've got to go to Rainer, you've got to go to Hamnoy. There are certain places that you want to go. Uh, and, and because if you don't, you don't sell the workshop. That's the reality, uh, more often than not. But then, you know, you then got to go on your own and discover little hidden gems to not only satisfy yourself, uh, because I think that fuels the fire. Um, if, if all I ever shot were iconic shots, whether in my own style or otherwise, I would be, I'd be hanging myself from the rafters. There has to be a certain amount of, 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 of there's got to be something more in your shots. There's got to be more of you in your own shots um, to feed your creative uh, soul, if you will. Um, if you then can pass that on to your clients, all's the better because they're obviously benefiting as well. But primarily, you've got to go out on the personal side of things and you've got to satisfy your own desires because if you didn't, then you'd probably give up on the whole photography malarkey because you'd only be doing it for money. And that's not what I'm about. I'm, you know, I do it because I love photography and I, I love to help people love theirs as well. So it, an interesting question. Um, in terms of pre-planning, I use things like um, the photographer's ephemeris, photo pills, which give you directions on the sun direction and various other things you know i use nortide.com which is an app uh that gives you all of your uk tides uh it's about seven quid a year there's you know uh, if anybody's interested i do have a pdf on all the apps that i use for weather for you know for wrecking uh, everything basically so if anybody's interested in that you know send me a message and i will happily send you the pdf and you can download all the apps some of them are chargeable not a great deal of money, but they do help in researching locations or when you're there. So good well, question. There is, that. Good there is another thing though. Yep. It's handy if you've got a mate called Chris who does all the research on Google for you. Yeah. So we go away and he yeah. has pins everywhere dotted and he says, we're going here and here and here and here and here. He does. And I go, he, does oh, he does all I the donkey go. work for you. He does and I go, yeah, just let's yeah. go. <laughs> so just get yourself a Chris. That's my yeah. advice. <laughs> yes, yeah. Exactly also, he's, that. Great, he's great at doing websites as well. So <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, Coming bloody brilliant at doing websites actually, isn't he? Um I'm trying to remember the company name about by which he goes by, but yeah, but anyway. But yeah, he's the, very website good. Guy. the website guy. The website guy. Uh, anybody wants a website building on WordPress in particular, superb. He's kept me in business for years, so uh he, he must be good. Uh <laughs> Right, Les Forrester asks, not including each other, because that's cheating, uh, name your top five UK-based photographers, landscape photographers, uh, and why, and then your top five worldwide landscape photographers. <laughs> so, <coughs> shall I go? I've made a list. Have you done five? Yeah, but I can do three. Well, I've written them down, so I can go, go for through. Five, go for five. five. I go for five. Uh, you might just want to bring your mic a bit closer to you. I think maybe might just be dropping off a bit. All right, top five UK. Paul Gallagher uh, was sort of a mentor to me in my early years. I would say uh, ten years ago was Paul uh, runs a, a big um, workshop company uh, called Aspect to I. Uh, I think he's one of the top UK photographers. Uh, super. Um, so Paul Gallagher number one. Number two. Uh, my new favourite photographer at the moment, Guy Edwards. If I had to give a, a trophy out last year uh, for uh, a, a photographer that I have discovered whose work I really, really admire, I would say it's Guy Edwards. Um, partly because he can shoot a wide variety of subjects, which is bloody difficult to do. Uh, you know, I, I'm not a wildlife macro uh, photographer. I am purely a landscape photographer. Um, you know, and a specialize in that field so for anybody to be able to uh to shoot shoot different genres at a high level fair play uh lee frost been following lee for years uh, in the old days when i would buy magazines does anybody still do that uh, that was the only way that you could 
before the internet really, or, or certainly in the very early days of the internet, the only way you could follow your, your favorite photographers primarily was through magazines and they would write features. And I always remember the very first black and white long exposure shot that I saw was of Embleton Bay in Northumberland at Dunstanborough Castle. And it was a Lee Frost image and I've been following ever since. Uh, he just has an uncanny knack wherever he is, whatever he's shooting, street photography, architectural photography uh, in New York, say. Uh, it really doesn't matter. Yeah, very, very good photographer. And number four, Dave Fieldhouse. Uh, he's come on leaps and bounds, I think. I, I had the, the very good fortune and pleasure of having Dave uh, escort me around the Peak District ooh, four or five years ago, maybe, maybe six years ago. I think he just won a category in the Landscape Photography of the Year of a Peak District shot in Frost with a little rabbit and the cement factory. Beautiful shot. Um, I had a really enjoyable day with, uh, day with Dave, but his work's just gone, you know, really. I think Charlie Waite gave him his award last year, the Charlie Waite Award for Charlie's most favourite image. A beautiful uh, street scene, wasn't it, with the water reflections and... Gorgeous, with the ice. Uh, on the yeah, cobbles. The yeah, it was just, yeah, Dave Fieldhouse, super photographer. Um, just two more. <laughs> I'm about six. Um, Rowan Riley, uh, Irish, uh, long exposure, superb long exposure photographer. Ronan Riley, R O H A N R E I L L Y, superb long exposure photographer. And also Bruce Percy. Um, you know, I think some of my favourite Iceland shots that I've seen of anybody has been Bruce. He is very minimalist these days, but very, very, uh, very high standard. Expensive workshops, but years and years and years of experience. Um, Tony? <laughs> so, that's, so that's the UK market wrapped up. Are you doing international as well? I can do international. I've only got two because unusually I'm not really... <clears throat> You know, I'm not, I'm not hugely inspired by, by photographers, you know, in, in the way that I would be when I first came into photography. As I have progressed, uh, a lot of the people that I perhaps admired have probably fallen off the radar a little bit. Uh, but the two at the moment that I'm catching my eye, I would say Peter Lick. Uh, it's a bit of a comical name. Uh, Tony's laughing. <laughs> but, <laughs> he's doing more than laughing. But uh, have a look at Peter Lick's... Uh, sort of photography uh but yeah um born in australia lives in the uh, u.s now um it, it's it, you would say it's a, a sort of a you know very colorful american style landscape photography we'll leave it at that and the other one at the moment is daniel corden but again you know uh, it's a lot of fine art sort of looking images um uh, there are not a lot of international photographers that i follow um that don't have their images look like Daniel Corden's. And whilst it's not a style that I'll go for, I think, you know, I think it is, it, you know, a lot of it's uh, using luminosity masks, you know, it's, it's not the sort of stuff that I shoot or aspire to shoot, but for those that do it and do it well, like Daniel, then, uh, then fair play. But I don't really follow a lot of uh, sort of international photographers that sort of float my boat really. But um, yeah, so that's my seven or eight. <laughs> I've not got I've not got so many no. um, mine are mine are like pretty obvious everybody <laughs> you uh, start off Mark Little John yeah for me I followed his work for years I followed his work before he won landscape photography of the year and mm. his was a style that a lot of people are copying now yeah. myself included copying not copying his images copying his style of work mm. even his style of processing um, because it was so new and fresh, yeah. And he's got, he's got a great eye. I love it. I love his work. He, he takes pictures with mobile with a mobile phone that most people <laughs> couldn't even dream of taking with a five thousand pound camera. You know, so he's very. very <laughs> but he's in the right places at the right time, and he spends a lot of time up on the fells looking for light. You know, he's, he's very right. good, and he, he's been a big, he's big a big influence. Um, yeah. Another Lakeland photographer, Colin Bell. I don't think I think he lives down near Manchester nowadays or something. But um, yeah, he's done a lot of work in the lakes. I love his very 
crisp, clean um, images of Elterwater, a place where I've spent a lot of time, and Holmfell, where I've also been a lot. Yeah. Probably 30, 40, maybe 50 times I've been up Holmfell. You know. Popular. So I love Colin Bell's work. If you've not seen it, check it out. It's very, very good. He's not as well known as the others, but great yeah. photographer. I do have and his. Then, book, I do have his book, by the way. He brought a book out last year, the year before. Very, yeah, very good. Healing, healing, it's called. It's all sold out. All five hundred copies. You can't get any more. Yeah. Um, and then, then some big names. David Ward. Yeah. I just love David Ward's work. You know, he his ability to capture really, really good detail photography is unbelievable yeah. anyone who's tried detail work and on my workshops this might put people off booking on one of my workshops <laughs> I, insist, I insist that people try some detail photography yeah. and then they can if they've never tried it before they realize how unbelievably difficult it is to get a great shot of detail it's yeah. easy to take detail shots easy to get a great shot or a very good shot of detail is extremely difficult. They're nearly all naff, yeah. you know, so his ability to do that. And I mean, his wider landscapes are great as well, but it's his detail work that's special. Yeah. And then finishing, I'm only going to say four. I'll just go straight in for the big hitter, Joe Cornish. Right. <laughs> you know, I do love Joe Cornish's work. He's got depth. He's, they're just beautiful. I love the, the classic they kind of got a classical feel feel to them. He gets a lot of depth through his images. He has lovely foregrounds. He uses light. It's just, I just, I can look on Joel Cornish's website and look through his images and it's just quality, really, really beautiful work. And he's just one of the best, you know? So that's my four. Masters. Yeah. Well, I mean, I was at his gallery before Christmas and uh sort of had a really good look around his gallery and uh david ward's work was there as well actually so i got that got that opportunity to see that up close as well uh but you know joe's back catalog is huge absolutely massive and uh, some beautiful work in there there's no doubt about it not all to my taste but you know it's all quality and and that's the difference isn't it you know but the guy's been shooting on film for many many years you know he brings over to digital an awful lot of experience and it's uh and I, I think it shows, um, you know, uh, these these kind of people have been shooting, you know, uh, <laughs> just just out of nappies, you know, giving a box well, brownie speaking, for for Christmas. Speaking of speaking of been doing it for years, if I was going to pick an international, I would only go for one, and it's the biggest name, it's Michael Kenner. You know, <laughs> he's he's on everybody's top top few list of photographers. <laughs> He's something special. And if you've, if you've not seen his videos, go on YouTube mm. and check out Michael Kenner's videos. Yeah. Uh, obviously, after you've, after you've watched Melvin's and mine, uh, just <laughs> yes, keep working your way up the level from Melvin then to me. Then to <laughs> <laughs> Somebody asked who was more modest, me or Tony. <laughs> there's, there's your answer. There's <laughs> your answer. answer. <laughs> yeah. So there you go. So, no, excellent question. Um, yeah, good answers. Yeah, Michael Kenner. Uh, the kind of photographer that when you look at the work, you think, I could do that. No, you really couldn't. You really yeah. couldn't. It's so simple, but it's because it's so simple that it's so difficult. I remember reading a story where he was in New Zealand and he'd gone up to the roof of the hotel and he set his camera up to do uh, several hours of film, uh, you know, because it was a film camera. And he had to, you know, leaving the shutter up for hours and hours. Uh, and I think it was going to go up there about three or four hours later then found that the hotel staff had locked the door. So he'd gone to bed and he woke up and he just managed to get up there just before the sun rose and the images worked absolutely uh, perfectly. You know, I mean, that's a guy committed to his art. And I really appreciate when somebody goes out of their way to create something that little bit special. I mean, you know, because it's all about effort uh, and dedication and time and, and effort, and it, it, it's the whole package. But yeah, Michael Kenner, yeah, yeah, you can YouTube him. He, he's, he's, he's there, isn't he? Um, a question from Louise. Welcome, welcome, Louise. Uh, editing the shots that you choose or chose as favourites of each other. How would you edit them differently to um, adapt them to your own styles? So the shot that I chose of yours of the water at Paris and my Buttermere's shot that you picked up mine how would you I, I wouldn't i wouldn't edit it any different it's a great shot mm. that's why i've picked it as my favorite shot you've taken yeah. so then i wouldn't 
if it needed tweaking, it wouldn't have been my favourite shot. Mm. So I wouldn't I'd do anything to it. I would just leave it as it is. I'd go with that. Yeah. How do you improve on perfection, Louise? <laughs> well, they wouldn't ask us to. <laughs> <laughs> but very good question. But yeah, a nice quick answer for a change. Um, all right. Ryan Downey. Good question, this. Is composition more important than light? And if so, why? Shall I go first? It'd be very well, quick. I'll just start. I think I'm tempted to say no. I'm tempted to say no. I'm tempted to say that yeah. although composition is absolutely critical, the more time I spend photographing the landscape, mm -hmm. the more that light is playing a massive part. You know, and if I look at an image mm -hmm. that's got no light, you know, how good is it really? You know, it's the light that Well, you need it. both, don't you? You do. You, you do both. need both. You, yeah. It's not like one or the other. And it's yeah. an impossible question to answer. I suppose for me, if I'm just sort of rating them in order of what I put at the top, yeah. it's light. It's absolutely light. Um, in, in wedding photography, <coughs> yeah. the, top, the top ranking thing is moment. So the most important thing is moment. Yeah. Then comes kind of light composition, that kind of thing. And, and down, actually down at the bottom, technical, the technical quality mm -hmm. of it. Whereas in landscape, the technical is higher yeah. um, and there's no moments really. It's more composition and light and yeah. you can't separate them. But, no. you know, the key. And, and the, another thing is having done a lot of landscaping for many years, mm. it sounds a bit cocky, but composition becomes kind of second nature i don't yeah, have yeah. to spend that long on composition therefore yeah. i can spend my time mm -hmm. trying to include and, and sort of predict amazing conditions and amazing light and then the composition it just kind of comes when yeah. you get to that level then you know you're getting a real grasp on landscape photography yeah yeah uh, whereas i'd say it's the other way around it, it's interesting i think the composition certainly when you're teaching it but and it's very difficult to teach composition. People often ask me, can you teach people composition? Because you can teach people the technical aspects of photography, uh, you know, but it, 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 some people just don't have the eye full stop. It doesn't matter what you put in front of them. It could be a lone tree in the middle of an Australian outback with an oasis around it, and people still, some people still wouldn't know what to shoot. Um, but that's where composition really comes in. I think it can be taught. Uh, I think there are certain basic uh, features that you can utilize to help people uh, sort of visualize a scene. For me, I tend to use patterns and shapes. So when I, whenever I'm in an, an environment, I tend to not look at it as a scene, but as a, an amalgamation of different shapes and different patterns in which I then slot together like a jigsaw, which is quite interesting. Um, light is very important, but I think light comes and goes and you can't really dictate really what happens with the light whereas composition that's all you that's all you if you get a lousy composition that's down to you because that composition will never change primarily if you go down to say Kimbridge bay yes there might be a lovely tide coming in and you want to get a particular uh, sort of section of rocks or or a little ledge in which the water runs off that's going to be quite limited to the conditions at the time but if you go somewhere where the composition rarely changes let's say Malham tree in the Yorkshire uh, Dales. So you get all that lovely limestone pavement. Now you and I have been up there and we've walked around an hour trying to find, trying to find a pattern within those limestone pavements that actually lead you through to the image. It's bloody difficult, it's really hard. And um, it doesn't matter how much good light you've got, if the composition just doesn't work, then you're on a hiding to nothing. But whether there's light or there's no light, there is still a composition there to be had. I think the light adds an extra element to the image, and that's what we're all gunning for. But the composition is something that you can constantly work on until, like you say, once you've gone so far down the road a few years into your photography, it becomes second nature. And that's one of the joys of photography is when you get to that level, that wherever you go, you know that you're going to get a quality image, composition. You've got the right tools and the right equipment, and you know how to use them. 
And you've just built up a whole arsenal of tools to help you get a particular shot. The one thing you can't control is the light, but there are certain things even there you can predict uh, by using apps, by looking up into the sky, by, by planning when, you know, in what direction the sun's going to come in. You can do certain things in advance to put yourself in the best place at the best time. But I think composition is absolutely key uh, above light, but ideally I'm after both whereas you tend to go more for light. So our approaches are perhaps a little different in that, but really good question, actually, Ryan. Really good question. Um, Ian, opinion. When you're looking to photograph an area that you've never been to before, what research do you do beforehand to help you plan your recce of the area, both in terms of what season or seasons and what time of day you will physically go to recce it? We kind of covered this earlier a bit, didn't yeah. we? In terms yeah. of, you know, I get Chris to do it. You do a bit yourself. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, we kind of talked about that. We, we don't want to rehash too all that. Much now. But I, I will use Flickr for argument's sake. Give you a quick example. The Maraki boulders in New Zealand. I wanted to, to try and de determine at what height the tide should be in order to surround the four million year old uh, spherical boulders uh, you know if the tide was in too high it would cover them if it was in if it didn't come in far enough then obviously it would be nowhere near them and i use Flickr, and i spent hours on Flickr looking through lots of images looking at the average time at which they were taken going back through looking at tide tables uh, historical tide tables to work out an average height and when i got there in new zealand Perfect. Perfect for sunrise. So that was a lot of effort had gone in to get that one particular shot of the, of the boulders at the sunrise. And we had an amazing sunrise. So when you put that level of dedication into a shot, rather than just ambly, you know, casually ambly, uh, you know, walking along a beach, uh, you know, when you put that much effort into getting the shot. When you get it, you know, and there are in my top three images of, of self-satisfaction, Meraki boulders, from 2018, no question about it. So really interesting, but Flick is actually a very, very good tool to use, partly because they also quite often tell you the focal length and the equipment used as well, as well as the EXIF. So use Flickr while it's still here, <laughs> because at some point it might well not be. But yeah, good question, Ian. Right, Chris, good. What's the one thing that looking back gave you that step change in the quality of images you were making. Can it, it can be technique, technological, or something else. Over to you, Tony, I think. Yeah, good question, good question. Mm. I was making steady progress, improving as a landscape photographer for several years. Um, and then I had a short period where it's very difficult for me to describe why it happened. But I went from taking average photographs, taking a few good photographs, you know, to, to almost, there was like a line. And from that line, I was able to take almost a really good picture every single time I went out. And it didn't even seem to matter too much on the conditions. Um, I was able to adapt to what the conditions were, use a style that was appropriate for those conditions and get a good image every yeah. time I went out, more or less. Obviously, nobody can do it all the time. No, no. But I started doing this, and I've looked back at it and thought, why was it? And, and I can even pinpoint it down to a couple of trips where it changed. One was, both times I was out with my friend Chris, one was over to the um, Twistleton Scar on the limestone pavements. And Yorkshire, yep. Yeah, the ter conditions were, it was, I mean, bitterly cold. It was absolutely freezing. You know, when you, it's hurting and you can't even operate your camera without gloves on. Been up there. <laughs> and I took a photograph. There was no light. It was flat. And I took a photograph of a fern in one of the recesses in the limestone. And I, and I was thinking about landscape in a different way. And then the following week, we went up Luffrig Fell to Todd Crag at sunset. And I photographed. Um, this wonderful light with the sheep on it and, and, and the, the sunset and everything. It was, it was a really nice shot. And I just internally, I felt like I was 
engaging with the landscape in a different way and it, it's very hard to describe it almost sounds spiritual yeah. spiritual or mystical but something had changed and i was seeing the landscape in a new way mm. and all new opportunities and possibilities were opening up and and i think this happens and i do think to get to that level and i believe i've improved since then but i kind of made a step up i believe to get to there te technical aspects of photography and mm. the compositional aspects have to become absolutely second nature mm. so at that yeah. point i was no longer thinking about technical it's just i can just do it me yeah. equipment i knew me equipment inside out i knew where everything was in my bag i had a system compositions just came so then i was allowed i had the freedom to yeah. visually explore the landscape and decide what and how i want to capture images and that was the big leap for me so it will happen but you've got to put the work in to get there yeah. and i think you've got to almost I, I do do a fair bit of like meditation and that kind of thing and i believe almost getting into a state of meditation in the landscape where you're not demanding from the landscape you're just reacting to what happens and what changes and i think being in that kind of mind space allows yeah. you to take images which have got far more depth and interest and quality and um, so it's all it's all in here it's all in here yeah it's an interesting point um i mean i don't think i've got a specific time uh or a specific visit in which um I had noticed a step change. Uh, I guess, first of all, you're never happy with your work. I never look at, a, I never look at an image that I take and think, that's as good as it's going to get. Um, you might fall lucky occasionally. Uh, say the fog bow is a, is a prime example of being in the right place at the right time. And that's a one in a million shot. But the reality is, there's always something that niggles me about my work. Um, and, and it's that pursuit of going out repeatedly and wanting to uh, i wouldn't i wouldn't say achieve perfection i'm certainly uh, you know i'm much much happier with the quality of my work now there's absolutely no doubt about it and i think a lot of what you said about going out understanding your equipment to the point where it's not even an issue because and i see it all the time as you do when you're when you're helping people who are first coming into photography they're that engrossed and that concerned about the camera and how they're actually going to operate it, certainly in manual mode, that they have no more capacity to yeah, look at the absolutely. scene and, and, and even deal with that. What, what they're doing is, is they're doing it back to front. They're worrying about a piece of equipment before seeing a scene and then saying, right, I know what I want to shoot. I just need help in how to shoot it. They're going, well, I don't know how to shoot it because I don't know how this box of tricks works. And I think, well, once you get to that level where you know your camera equipment and you stand there and you think whatever, whatever is put in front of me in terms of light, uh, composition, weather, anything, I have the tools. I have the filters. I have the camera equipment. I have the tripod. I can get the shot and I know how to get the shot. What is it that I'm after? What is it that's going to uh, satisfy uh, my, my craving, really, for, for trying to, for, again, trying to connect with a place in particular, but also represent it well to other people who have perhaps never seen that place as well. I want people to look at my work and, and find it achievable for themselves uh, on a very similar level. It's all very well capturing images, uh, fine art images, but the reality is, you know, <laughs> your clients aren't going to get that. That's something that you've developed over 10 years. I want to take shots that other people can get as well that I are don't. fairly close to, you know, fairly See, close that's to... That's where we differ. Yeah. <laughs> I want to take elite pictures that people go, I'll never be able to take a picture that good. Ah, and I you... say to them, you're right, yeah. you won't. <laughs> but you can get elite shots, but without them looking otherworldly. That's the difference. High quality. Yeah. You don't have to alter the scene too much. Um, but I think when, when I turned pro six years ago, more than six, 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 six years ago, um, when you then go into this full time and, you know, I'm probably shooting less now than I was when I was a hobbyist, ironically. Um, but I have more intensive periods. So previously I would go out for lots of days out quite, quite, quite often, uh, with you and, and also 
you know, a couple of other friends. And so I'd be out probably every week shooting one day a week. Now I'd probably not shoot for a whole month, but do a whole week in one particular place. And my approach is very, very, very different. And what you find is, and I think the reason why people go on workshops, certainly multi-day workshops, is by, say, day three of a five or a six-day workshop, they're really getting into it. And they're in that zone. And they're seeing the things that you're seeing. And the, 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 the joy on their face when they're finally understanding and they're feeling uh, the landscape and, and what they want from it, that's absolutely fantastic. And, um, you know, but, it, it's, it's, but there was no particular uh, moment where I thought, you know, this is as good as it gets. For me, the, the challenge in wanting to constantly improve uh, is what gets me out of bed in the morning. You know, knowing that I'll probably never achieve perfection because it doesn't exist. But I, it doesn't stop me trying to, uh, to uh, achieve it, um, you know. But there are other reasons why I do photography as well. It's not all about, you know, look. If you can look at an image and you're, you're, you know, it, it moves you or it touches you. Uh, you know, quite often now we're in lockdown. You know, I'm looking back through a lot of images over the last two years that I've not had time to edit. And some of the memories that those images bring back, uh, you know, you're reliving those trips and those, you know, to some of the world's most beautiful places. You know, photography, uh, you know, it has its uses beyond just having an image on a wall. It really, really does. But um, just shooting more, I think, you know, and thinking about it from a, a pro perspective and just, you know, uh, because the reality is, and it's quite interesting, uh, it's a conversation that we've had on the odd occasion, um, you know, you've got to try and attain a very, very high standard of work before anybody else is going to entrust you to help them do the same. And I think, you know, there's a lot of photographers out there now probably are putting style over substance, but I think your groundwork has to be get your photography right first and foremost. Everything else will kind of slot into place, you know, beyond that, I think. So um, just be dedicated to your art form. If you love what you do, you'll, you'll put a hundred and, well, 100% into it. You can't put 110%. 100% is 100%. <laughs> Give it everything you've got. <laughs> shows and, yeah. you know, and yeah, if it shows, it shows. Uh, Saji Ranj uh, Raj, Rajendan Dran. God, I'm terrible with names. Sorry, uh, Saj. Uh, any tips for changing lenses during bad weather? Yeah. <laughs> have a system. You've got to be practised and you've got to have a system. I have a bag that flips up. I, have, I always have the wind behind me. I'm using myself as a shield. I take my camera off. I put it under the shield and it's switch, 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 done, bump, done, quickly. Yeah. None of this hanging about, oh, you know, what, what, you know. In difficult conditions, mm. most people can't shoot. They're not practiced enough with their equipment. Um, that's one of the differences between somebody who has spent a lot of time doing it and somebody who hasn't is yeah. when the conditions get tough, you know, that's where it kind of separates the men from the boys. Mm. But the, the strange thing is when the conditions get tough often, that's when you get the best shots. Yeah. So having an ability to change lenses and use your, use your gear. I've thought actually about sometime doing a, a YouTube video mm. to show people how I change lenses in bad conditions because, and it's something that I actually cover on my workshops. It sounds a bit mundane, but so often I'm, I've got people on a workshop who've been photographing for years and they've got no system in place for changing lenses if the mm. conditions are bad, yeah. you know, or even putting the gear away into the bag. How do you take, your tri take it off your tripod and put it into your bag as quickly and efficiently as possible um, and, and having your bag ordered and neat? Yeah. So that it fits your style of working. I know where every lens is. I know where all my filters are. I know everything. And you get some people and they go, oh, right. And they open the bag and it's like, <laughs> and then the peering in it, like, oh, what, what we got here? <laughs> you know, looking around and it's like, what, what are you doing? Have it set out. You, they often have too much stuff in it yeah. and they don't know where it is. Yeah. And being kind of ordered and uh, a bit kind of military, mm. you know, having a bit of a military soldier approach yeah. to your bag in the long term pays off and allows you to capture pictures that you wouldn't other capture, otherwise yeah. capture. It's an interesting point. And, and, and 
again, if you know where everything is, you can get to it incredibly quickly. There are times when you'll pull the car up, you know, in a hurry because you'll see a fleeting moment of light that will be gone in 20 seconds. But if you're opening your bag and you don't know where anything is, you're going you're gonna to miss it. So that, that's, uh, that's a big help. And I will say, again, with technology, I mean, I have a system where I hold the camera. Uh, I have uh, the secondary lens, if I'm not by the bag, between my legs. I take one lens off, goes between my legs. I grab the other one and it goes on. But in the meantime, I have the camera to my body so that the, 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 the opening, the, the flange, if you will, is not exposed. However, so that you then reduce the chances of getting, uh, you know, debris and, and, and various things on your sensor. However, the EOS R Canon, as soon as you take the lens off, there's a plastic shutter that closes to reduce massively the amount of dust that gets in on the sensor. Now, I know the Sony A7s are notorious for dust on the sensors. Any, <laughs> anybody that shoots landscapes with a Sony A7 will tell you one of the biggest failing of that camera system is the amount of stuff that gets on the sensor and just wrecks the images even if they're very, very careful. But now I can open up the Canon, you know, I can wish it around, there's a plastic flange, and I have it probably cleaned once, maybe twice a year now, instead of having to do it every six weeks or even every two, two and a half months. Because bearing in mind, when you're traveling around the world, you're in different, different weather patterns, you know, you're in different places, you know, you're changing lenses nearly every day, it's very, very difficult to keep the sensor clean, but this EOS R Canon, has done a superb job in keeping debris off your screen. But you're right. I've seen people take a lens off a camera on a tripod, walk 20 foot to their bag, whilst leaving the camera switched on and exposed, and they're rummaging around for what lens they want to put on, and then they walk back. And you're looking, thinking, well, that's your, that's your shots room. Your sensor's going to be obliterated with debris and with, with dirt and various other things. So it is very uh, important that you teach people uh, you know, how to change lenses and also how to set up your tripod properly so that you don't end up damaging those lenses when the camera falls over with the tripod. How many times have we seen that? <laughs> set your tripods up properly. We do tripod management. It's, it's a bit mundane, but it's so important, especially in wind. And if you're shooting anywhere like Iceland, <laughs> you've got to know how to shoot in the wind. Oh, my Lord. Especially with big lenses, like Tony was saying earlier, with big lenses, get a, get a tripod collar so that the lens sits on the tripod head rather than the camera with the lens flopping about, if you will, with, with, with a bit of movement. Yeah, good question. And, and, and anything else to add to that, Tony? I did have something, but I forgot. <laughs> You're doing well. You're doing well. But it can't have been that important. No, no. <laughs> well, that was, yeah, it's come back. It's come back. This is a, this is a tip. Yeah. I have my bag set up so that I can put my camera in my bag with the 70 to 200 on or with a wide angle lens on any lens it can go in mm. or I can put it in with me so I can put my camera with me 24 70 on in my bag mm. and have me 70 to 200 elsewhere or switch them around. It's amazing how many people don't have the camera bag set up so the camera can go in their bag with the 70 to 200 because if I've mm. been shooting on it, on the 70 to 200 and it's raining, all I want to do is take it off and put it in my bag. And some people, they go, oh, I can't do that. I yeah. have to change lenses to put it away. You just add in a lens change where it's not necessary. Yeah. So, you know, it's just think about it. That's a good point. And by the way, we both use uh, a Mindshift Backlight 26L, 26 litre bag. Right. Uh, we've, listen, we've both had many bags haven't we and uh, it's a very contentious issue everybody's yeah. got their favorite f-stops here and low pros there manfrotto's here but i have to say that that mind shift which is a subsidiary of think tank is a fantastic yeah. bag it's as close to perfection as i could possibly want to uh, purchase if i was to design one myself there'd be a couple of things that change but really it's as good as it gets it opens yeah. from the back so you can have it you know you can have your your waist belt attached uh, you know, if you're in the ocean uh, or anywhere like that, or you're in uh, a place where you don't want to put the bag down, you can uh, take your shoulder straps off, swing your bag around, open up the zip, and the, the bag actually has a, a neck strap that goes around to hold the flap open so that you can get to all your lenses and all your kit 
without putting the bag down. It is brilliant. A rare opening bag. They're about 240 pounds. They're not cheap, but you know, they do use things like YKK zips and various other things, but they are superb. I have to say, I couldn't recommend them highly enough. How, how long have we been going, Mel? How long have we been talking? Um, that's a very good question. It doesn't tell me. But anyway, we'll get down how to the last two or three questions and we'll leave it at that. I think, I think we've been going a long time. We'll, we'll do I another think... couple of questions and then we'll finish it. Should we, or do you want to come back to these on another one, maybe? Um, well, we'll do two more, end it there, and then we might do another video for those uh, who request it. <laughs> they might decide that this is all they want. <laughs> I, think, I think it's been going a bloody long time, this, Mel. Seven yeah, o'clock. People can always... What I'll do is I will... Seven o'clock. I think we've been talking for two hours. I feel like I've got fatigue. <laughs> one more question then. Let me pick. One more. One more. Let me pick a good question. I mean, listen, if, if anybody's still watching this, kudos. Lockdown <laughs> nobody, or no lockdown. Nobody's watching. This is just me and you talking now. <laughs> the lockdown <laughs> about two weeks. Nobody is this desperate to watch no. this for two hours solid. Not even no. we're going to. If we didn't have to do it, we wouldn't be. Someone, no, what someone might do, they might fast forward to the end and they just hear us two wittering on about nobody watching it. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. Right, let's have a quick look. Um, all right, quick one from Kwame, uh, Asia. Uh, you both have many great shots in your portfolio. Thank you very much. Uh, question one, which one shot are you most proud of and why? And question two, what is the most challenging conditions you've ever shot in? Your most proud uh, shot? Well, for me, it, it is a tricky one um, to think about it, but the shots I'm most proud of are almost always relatively recent. Mm. You know, when, once I move six months past the shot, they kind of, I, th mm. I kind of think, well, they're, they're old news. I might still like them, yeah. but there's new ones that I'm really happy with. And that's just the way it seems to work with me. And so the shot I'm most proud of at the moment is one of the shots that I took recently at Elgo. Mm -hmm. And it's, um, there's a hail, there's a hailstorm blowing through. There's a bit of a rainbow, the mountains illuminated. It's, it's just a really, I, I just love that shot. You know, uh, Melvin's seen it, it's a cracker. I've never put it out there because I often sit on photos for months and months before I share them. I just like to enjoy them myself. Um, I might post it sometime soon, I don't know. But yeah. that at the moment, well, the shot I'm, <laughs> yeah, that is the shot I'm most proud of. Just yeah. because it's got, it's got all that drama and mood and it's just yeah. it packs a lot of punch and it's pin sharp. And for the conditions, I shot it during the middle of a storm, 60, 70 mile an hour winds. It is mm. pin sharp. Uh, and it's just one that I love. I keep looking at it and thinking, every time I open the file up, go into it and look, I say to myself, you are good. <laughs> <laughs> There's that modest question again. <laughs> Answered. <laughs> and you most, you, I was going to say, your most challenging conditions. Well, I, I, think, I think we're both... We, we, I think the, the answer is going to be that we were both together in the sky on this one because... Oh, no doubt. No doubt. The Coral Beach. Uh, yeah, Craigian. Craigian Beach. There's one Coral Beach on Sky, amazingly enough. And we were there during... It was a beautiful... Almost a summer's day. It was gorgeous. And there was the coral. There was the beautiful colours in the water. And then within a space of about a minute, it turned <sighs> horrific. Wind that you could barely stand up in, let alone shoot. And it came out of absolutely nowhere from an idyllic seen to something out of a, a horror movie in one minute. And we weren't alone. We, we, I think we had a few other people with us as well. It was <laughs> unbelievable. Um, so no, we couldn't shoot in that. <laughs> it, was just, it was just nuts, that. It, it, it was the way it went. Oh no, Melvin. Uh, are you thinking fairy think tales? I'm thinking Glen Brittle. Yes, the, the rain. When we had that, that <laughs> rain bomb. That was crazy. I was photographing at Glen Brittle, not at the ferry pools, at the next river along. Yeah, yeah. Me and Melvin were there. I was higher up the, the little waterfall. He was lower. Yeah. And 
I was kind of working and honestly, <laughs> I turned round to like have a go at Mel. My instinct was, because I thought he'd just come up and chucked a bucket of water on me. <laughs> That's what it felt like. It felt yeah. like a bucket of water was just hitting me and yeah. I just instantly got my coat and just covered my camera. I didn't have time to put it away because it was coming down the most crazy heavy rain you've ever known. And I just covered my camera and I just, I thought, I don't know what I'm going to do here. And I just waited. And then in about, would you say two minutes? Not even that. Not even that, maybe a minute. 30 seconds, I reckon. 30 seconds seconds to me. And it was gone. And I was like, what's going on here? Absolutely drenched. And I just put my camera stuff away and I went down. (laughs) I remember Melvin turned around to look at me and he went like, what what was that? And I think it was a rain bomb. You've seen them where they just suddenly drop. Bang. It must have been, because it wasn't just a shower, that was it. Oh, it was, it was instant. I mean, within half a sec, within a second, bush. It was like one of those planes had come over that they'd been using in Australia recently to drop water on the fires. It was like we were caught in that, but it lasted about <laughs> half a minute, at least half a minute. I had my bag open. I was in the river. <laughs> I, I ran for the bag to close it up, but it was absolutely drenched. I've never experienced that since, or, or before. Oh. Um, so, it was just weird, and that's also on yeah. Sky. So you know, Sky can be challenging. <laughs> what a great place! Great place. Yeah, be- for, yeah for those reasons. Uh, very quickly, my shot that I'm most proud of. I'd say two, really. I think Fogbo's got to be in there. The white rainbow, obviously. Um, just a one in a million shot. I'm never going to get again. Uh, and I would say a shot that I took. Um, about 18 months into my photography, probably the back end of 2008, coming out of Grisdale Forest in, uh, near Coniston in the Lake District, the light was dipping. It uh, had crepuscular rays coming through the trees. Uh, and the reason why it's probably one of my most proudest shots is because if I was there now with my knowledge that I've accrued and the equipment and everything else, I genuinely don't think I could do a better shot compositionally, the light, um, and there were, it, it, that image displays certain things that I was already thinking about, but not aware that I was thinking about. The composition of, you know, two trees, vertical, a horizontal, then a diagonal one that had fallen, the mist in the top right corner, the light, the moss, the color, the, the placement of everything, and the fact that I even saw it whilst walking back to the car. And I've seen it printed large. It was in a cafe in the Lake District for a couple of years. Uh, a really big print, and it just looked absolutely fabulous. It was taken on a Canon uh, 40D, top of the range crop camera, many, many years ago. I don't even know, how, 10 megapixel or whatever they are now, but it's fantastic. I just, you know, it's, it's, it, but it's an image I couldn't recreate uh, and do a better job on it now, I don't think. So uh, I'd have to go with that. And because it was taken so early on in my photographic journey, I think there's a particular, uh, you know, uh, that, that will tend to stay with me. Well, listen, I think on that score, <laughs> that nice quick Q&A, we've still got a few questions <laughs> to go. <laughs> we might do a part two. <laughs> Next one's going to be four hours long. <laughs> we might do that four weeks into lockdown. People might be really grateful. <laughs> I, don't, I, think, I don't think they'll ever be that bored. <laughs> Well, listen, thank you to everybody that's uh, written in. Sorry we didn't get to answer all your questions, but, you know, I've, I've had a blast. I've really enjoyed it. I'm sure Tony has as well. Yeah, I've used my words for the day because both me and Melvin, we both live on our own. So we're like cooped up with no one to talk to. That's why we've done two hours. <laughs> oh, dear. I'm happy to share it with you. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, I hope everybody's enjoyed uh, what we've uh, sort of contributed. I hope you've got something out of it. Uh, learned a couple of things. Been mildly entertained. <laughs> then that's uh, that's us over overachieved anyway. And, and you know, but anyway, uh, yeah. If you want to leave a comment underneath, uh, feel free to do so. And um, yeah, uh, if you have any more questions, fire them at me. Maybe we'll do a part two, three, four, and five. Maybe we'll just do a, a Fast and the Furious franchise. <laughs> Could still be here in August. Maybe we'll do this every month. Uh, maybe not. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, anyway, thanks for watching. And if you got to the very end, why? Well done. <laughs> anyway, yeah. it's goodbye from me. It's goodbye from him. <laughs>
<laughs> See you later, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. See you. Bye.